I'm going to turn us to Numbers uh, chapter 5, and um, we're going to, I'm going to read it in two sections, uh, or I'm going to read two chunks from it. One is a very small section at the start, and then a uh, much longer section, which is most of the chapter. So we're going to look at verses 1 to 4, and then from verse 11 to the end of the chapter. Uh, so if you've got a Bible, uh, do uh, feel free to, um, to follow along. In fact, please do follow along. Um, you find it helpful to have it open in front of you. The purity of the camp. The Lord said to Moses, command the Israelites to send away from the camp anyone who has a defiling skin disease or a discharge of any kind or who is ceremonially unclean because of a dead body. Send away male and female alike, send them outside the camp so they will not defile the camp where I dwell among them. The Israelites did so. They sent them outside the camp. They did just as the Lord had instructed Moses. And then reading from verse 11 of Numbers chapter 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him, so that another man has sexual relationships, uh, rela relations with her, and this is hidden from her husband, and her impurity is undetected since there's no witness against her, and since she has not been caught in the act. And if feelings of jealousy come over her husband, and he suspects his wife, and she is impure, or if he is jealous and suspects her even though she is not impure, then he is to take his wife to the priest. He must also take an offering of tenth of an ephah of barley flour on her behalf. He must not pour oil on it or, in, or put incense on it because it is a grain offering for jealousy, a reminder offering to draw attention to wrongdoing. The priest shall bring her and have her stand before the Lord. Then he shall take some holy water in a clay jar and put some dust from the tabernacle floor into the water. After the priest has had the woman stand before the Lord, he shall loosen her hair, place her in the hands of the remainder offering, the grain offering for jealousy, while he himself holds the bitter water that brings a curse. Then the priest shall put the woman under oath and say to her, if no other man has, got, has had sexual relations with you, and if you've not gone astray and become impure while married to your husband, may this bitter water that brings a curse not harm you. But if you have gone astray while married to your husband and you have made yourself impure by having sexual relations with another man other than, or with a man other than your husband, here the priest is to put the woman under this curse. May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. May this water bring a curse, enter your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. Then the woman is to say, Amen, so be it. The priest is to write these curses on a scroll and then wash them off into the bitter water. He shall make the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse. And this water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering will, uh, will enter her. The priest is to take from her hands the grain offering for jealousy, wave it before the Lord and bring it to the altar. The priest is then to take a handful of grain offering as a memorial offering and burn it on the altar. After that, he is to have the woman drink the water. If she has made herself impure and been unfaithful to her husband, this will be the result. When she is made to drink the water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering, it will enter her, her abdomen will swell, and the womb will miscarry, and she will become a curse. If, however, the woman has not uh, made herself impure but is clean, she will be cleared of guilt and will be able to have children. This, then, is the law of jealousy when a woman goes astray and makes herself impure while married to her husband, or when feelings of jealousy come over a man because he suspects his wife. The priest is to have her stand before the Lord and apply this entire law to her. But the husband will be innocent of any wrongdoing, but the woman will bear the consequences of her sin. Now, this is a very strange passage, even for the book of Numbers. And to be quite honest, it would be far easier, more convenient for me, if we just uh, moved on, said, uh, we don't have time to look at Numbers chapter 5. We're going to move on, look at number 6 or 7 or some other part of the book. After all, if you've been with us for a couple of weeks, you'll already know that we don't possibly have time to look at every passage in detail. So we're skipping over certain passages and focusing on others. And uh, uh, it might be far easier for me if we just move on, look at another passage. So why? Why bother to include this in our series? And I've got a couple of reasons that I want to share with you. First of all, I don't know whether you ever have this, where you, when this could just be me, you struggle with irrational fears, things that you know probably aren't true, but once you start to think about them and consider them, you start to fixate on them and you can't quite shift them from your head. So if you've ever been on a plane and you start daydreaming and thinking to yourself, I wonder if someone in this flight has managed to smuggle a bomb on board. And before you know it, 
you've persuaded your guy, yourself that the guy in 22E has got it in for you and it's going to be the death of you. <laughs> or maybe you think about it as nursing some suspect fears about what a boss at work thinks of you. Maybe some paranoia about your health. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> some of us, I think, just carry around in our heads a question of what is God, what is God like? Is there some part of God's character that just isn't good? And actually, that was the suspicion that Adam and Eve were planted with. They were tempted with that in the early pages of Genesis. And maybe we're under the same temptation, which we are. And so if you're reading through Numbers for yourself, don't you hit a passage like this and think, you know, maybe, just maybe, my faith is built on the premise that God is a cruel, misogynistic, unfair, unloving God. And you have some suspicion of that that can just eat away at you, and it just starts to fester and be the reason you start to withdraw from God. Whereas sometimes I think it's helpful for us just to look at our fears square in the eye and ask, is this right? And if there are passages in the Bible that we, well, we just can't make sense of them in terms of a straight reading of them, what does this say about God? We have to look right at them and ask, why has God placed this in the Bible? What is this scripture teaching me? What is God saying to me? And not be afraid of asking difficult questions. So that's the first thing. We have some convictions about the word of God that we're not fearful of asking difficult questions of passages that may unsettle us. Secondly, there's a bigger reason to look at this passage in the context of Numbers. Numbers 5 covers some ground in explaining some things in terms of a distinction between things that are clean and unclean, holy, sanctified, and unsanctified. And Hannah, uh, I'm sorry, our tech went all wrong this morning. I've already had a trip home to get a different device to display something. So we're going to, uh, I will show this uh, on the screen. Hopefully Hannah will be able to share this on the screen and you'll be able to see this. Um, but I hope you can see here, uh, uh, someone has put in diagram form a little bit about the distinction between clean, unclean. Oh, that hasn't come up on our screen. I hope you can see it at home. Maybe you can't. You can see it at home. We can't see it at the hall. There you go. You, you'll have to crowd around. The, oh, there you go. Thank you, Anna. I got it up for the hall as well. There we go. And what you'll see as we go through uh, things like Numbers 5, there's a, pl there's a place, there's a need for God's people to be spiritually clean. And even beyond that, for some of them, for some of the Levites, well, for the Levites as a group of people, for some of them to be sanctified and set apart as holy for God's use. So we have some different categorizations. We've got holy, we've got common or clean, and we've got unclean. And the unclean things can be purified and, 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 and normally be made clean. Or clean things, some clean things can be sanctified and set apart for God's use. And that passage from unclean to clean to holy is a path of life and yet of course there's a reverse path, path that you see on the bottom there with the bottom arrow that as things become moved from holy to uh, common or clean they are um, they are profaned or as clean things are, are desecrated or polluted they become unclean and that is the path of death and numbers tells us some of, of, of the how. How do you go walk in the stream, the path of life? And the, actually the how comes through sacrifice and cleansing. And here in the Old Testament, it's through ritual animal sacrifices around the, the tabernacle and what will eventually go on to become the temple. And so the, the, the passage from unclean to holy is, is through sacrifice. That's the path of life. But it also means on the bottom side that the path from holy to unclean is the path of death. Now, thanks, honey. You can get rid of that for a second. Um, one of the important distinctions to understand is that the path of death or the progression away to the unclean isn't simply sin. It's not only sin that defiles. It's anything that's connected to the fall. So you'll, you may have noticed in, in the first part of, of Numbers, even treating a, a dead body, which was the right thing for them to do, but even treating a right body, it made you unclean because it was a connection with death. It was a connection with unclean. In that sense, some of these instructions are not personal and certainly not necessarily sinful. And some things that sometimes you were considered unclean precisely because you'd acted rightly and, and responsibly and appropriately. Being unclean wasn't necessarily something to be feared. It wasn't necessarily about some terrible moral failure that has befallen you. But it was a recognition of maintaining distance. Just like self-isolating now, you wouldn't necessarily um, accuse someone of self-isolating through terrible behavior. They need to self-isolate because it's, it's the, the, the necessary and right and appropriate thing to do. 
So in the same way, the people are told, listen, the person who is not clean needs to step outside the camp. Now, the reasons for doing that are slightly different from why we might self-isolate, okay? First of all, these people have to leave the camp temporarily because the instruction is that God is holy and God is near his people. He says in, the, in, in, in Numbers 5, in, in verse 3, you know, don't defile the camp where I dwell among them. So this is not primarily about public safety. This isn't sage advice. It's God cannot be connected with death because he's the giver of life. And he can't be defiled and connected with sin because he is holy. And God is concerned to keep separate the clean and the unclean and even the clean and the holy or sanctified is, is, is distinct because of who he is and because he is there with his people. And so you sort of in numbers five, one to four, you see there is a regular flow of people into and out of the camp. Now, we need to remember at this point, okay, one of the reasons that Jesus entered the world is to bring repair to these things. It is very significant, very significant that Jesus, amongst his ministry, touched the leper. And as he did so, he said, do you remember, be clean. Or for the lady who was, who was bleeding, is healed with a single touch of Jesus. And Jesus even gives life to the dead with a healing touch. Because unlike the people here in Numbers 5, where there's a risk that that profane spreads, Jesus is able to absorb uncleanness and overwhelms it and spreads transformation and life because, because of Christ there isn't a penance to pay. Because of Christ there isn't a reason to withdraw because he brings you near. He absorbs death and he overpowers it with resurrection life. So we need to remember as we come to the rest of Numbers 5, this is a passage that whilst it might present for us some difficult questions, we've got to remember Jesus comes to fulfill to heal and to restore, not to alienate. Well, as we look through the bulk of the passage from verse 11 onwards, I want us to look at three things within this passage. I want, to, I want us to, and this is, this is not a normal sermon structure, I appreciate. The first thing though, I want us to consider some of the problems we might have with this passage. What are the issues that we can immediately spot? Then I want to respond to some of those different problems. And then I want to ask the question, well, why is this passage here? What are we supposed to do with a passage like this? And this is not just a brain puzzle to solve. This is God's word. Why is this here? What is he saying to us through it? Okay, so final, final thing we'll get to. So let's start firstly then with the, with the problems, the problems that we may spot with this passage. And first of all, is, is this passage just describing what we would now call as a trial by ordeal? Okay, the, the most famous barbaric trials by ordeals are the ones that happen in the Middle Ages, protesting whether a woman is a witch. You know, drown her, and if she survives, she is clearly a witch and ought to be killed. Another culture, at the same time that Numbers was written, suggested that women who were accused of adultery should have their hand placed in boiling water. If they didn't burn, they were guilty and should be killed. But if they were burned and scarred for life, at least everyone knew they were innocent. And for us, as we come to Numbers 5, we start to think, well, is this the same kind of barbaric, cruel, inappropriate way of dealing with people in the same way? First concern. Second concern. <laughs> Is this a process, and why is this a process that merely describes what a je jealous husband should do, but there doesn't seem to be a counterbalance? What happens if a wife suspects her husband of being unfaithful? And there's sort of something that might fester. Is this just the worldview of the Bible, a kind of presumption that women are unfaithful but not men? Is this just some ancient, what we might call Eve blaming? You know, the idea that because Eve was seduced with the words of Satan, it's women who are particularly, you know, easily seduced or something? And we know. We know that's not right. I mean, the Me Too movement has highlighted the way men in particular use and abuse their influence and strength to exploit and abuse women. And the Bible, we know, does not draw a particular fault line between men and women. It's very equitable in its verdict that all of us have fallen short of the, the glory of God. So I don't think what is being said is that women are particularly vulnerable to affairs, but there is a question here that we might have of this passage, and it's fair to raise it. Thirdly, this is describing what would be a humiliating and perhaps to some degree public process, and all because of the suspicions of the husband. How is it possibly fair that a husband, merely on suspicion, can expose his wife to this kind of humiliating process without any proof? What right does he have to expose his wife to this kind of process? And what does this process have to do with the priest? Another man, again, weighing in on what would surely just be a private matter. Why is this? Why does this kind of process 
exist? Isn't it just cruel and exploitative to pander to the insecurities of some suspicious husbands? Fourthly, different kind of concern. Just from what we know of God, does this process not sound somewhat superstitious? The priest is supposed to take dust from the tabernacle floor, mix it in with holy water, and stir it in with a piece of parchment with curses written on it. And maybe you're thinking, seriously, I mean, you know, I come to church this morning, we're talking about this, and this is what these people think? This is, if this is your first encounter, welcome to Grace Church. Maybe you're listening to this and thinking, oh my goodness, this is how they decide issues of truth and justice? If I walked into a different century, if I walked into a different millennium, you know, I thought Christianity was somewhat medieval. I didn't realize it was Stone Age in terms of how it works. And some people... Uh, would rightly ask that question and think through how are we supposed to make, make sense of this. And then there are all sorts of other concerns alongside. People have expressed concern about how miscarriage is spoken of in here and the justice of that and, and everything else. So have I at least set out some of your concerns as we're going through? If there's a glaring one that you can spot that I'm not raising, you can email me later and I can try and help with it. But let me talk for a moment now, having raised some of those concerns, say, well, what... How do we begin to respond to some of those concerns? Uh, first of all, I think it's significant that there is a process. You might not like or agree with the process, but there is a process. And unlike almost every other culture at the time, in Israel, a husband was not permitted to simply divorce his wife on mere suspicion or accusation. That actually, unlike other cultures around the time, God takes marriage very seriously. And God does not regard a wife as a property of her husband. If an accusation is made, there is a process. And with that, again, you might not agree with what the process is, but there is a way for the wife in this to be declared innocent. And in that way, actually, she avoids the terrible consequences of forever living under some suspicion. In ancient cultures, I mean, the need, the pressure to bear children was far greater than just for the sake of your own fulfillment, but the continuation of the family lineage, that was huge pressure. And women were under a very significant pressure to get pregnant. And it's not surprising that these accusations would muddle around. If, if a wife became pregnant, the husband suspects that the child might not be his. And in fact, it seems that this sort of trial maybe could only take place even if the woman is willing, because it offers her a way of clearing her name. It's vital to see that the process is actually, well, there is a process in place for someone to be declared innocent. That's the first thing. Secondly, it's vital to understand that the process is safe for the innocent and is bent in the favor of the accused, not against her. By which I mean the worst thing that happens in this process is drinking some bitter water, which is water mixed with some dust with a bit of ink residue. It is fairly unlikely that by normal means anyone would get sick in the way this passage describes. Which means that in order to be found guilty, something quite miraculous does have to happen where God intervenes and causes that bitter water to cause real sickness. It's not the same as some ridiculous medieval witch test where you subject a woman to something terrible and if she survives, it is proof that surely she is a witch. Here it's quite different. If nothing happens, that clearly proves she's innocent and she is declared innocent. Also, alongside this, we've got to see that the whole process is overseen by God. So verse 16, where the, the priest presents the woman in front of her to God, says these things matter, and it is God who decides what is really going on here. See, what's really going on is it, and this is, this is where it becomes broader than just the individuals in place. It's a test to see whether by something holy, what happens if you mix it with something else that may be holy or maybe not holy? And they regard the dust from the floor of the tabernacle, something, some component of their camp that is set aside for them. And it's ingested by this accused woman. And the point is that holy and unholy cannot be mixed, not without something being vomited out. There has to be a separation. One cannot tolerate the other. And there's a much greater significance to all of that that we'll look at it in a moment. But rather than just seeing this as something weird and superstitious, we have to understand the significance of the holiness of the temple. This is the place where God dwells. And it's a serious thing for unholy people to mix and mingle with a holy God. And so the test is, is what happens if we take something that is holy and, and mix it with something else? Does it, 
then we can see the holiness of, of the thing that we're, that we're testing. It's also, I think, important to see that when the woman is declared innocent, that is the end of the process. And that is the end of the accusation. That is very rare and very precious. In other cultures, the mere suggestion of, adul of adultery could ruin someone forever. The process is actually set, designed to set about to declare someone's innocence so this can never be held against her again. She does not have to spend the rest of her life defending herself and her children from false and malicious allegations, and it protects the children as well in that situation. And there is a wider, more general point to be understood. I think there is a perception that Christianity brought the world, and one of its great gifts to the world was oppressive, restrict restrictive mechanisms of control. And our culture kind of breathes a collective sigh of relief that finally we're free of all of that and look what freedom secularism has won for us. Maybe you read this and think, oh, great, another passage that encourages Christians just to harp on about their favorite thing, sex, especially forbidden sex. Isn't this all just so outdated and ridiculous? We've, thank goodness we've been liberated from all of this. I think there are some things that we, we need to push back on against some of that. I was reading a, an interview with Tom Holland, the historian. As far as I know, he's not a Christian. But he points out that in the ancient world, the Roman men had the right to behave however they want with anyone who was viewed as their subordinate. And he describes some of the terrible, awful, wicked sexual abuses that occur. But he goes on to say this, the novel assumption of the Christian framework which was initially being formed as far back as these passages in Numbers, is the foundation of monogamy, that God protects people by bringing them together. But then Tom Holland talks about how that's extended in the New Testament, that when Christ came, something foundational happened. He suffered death out of love for humanity. And that redefines love. Love is true love because it sacrifices power and self-interest for the sake of the other. And in the Christian worldview, this is considered God-likeness. It's the opposite, the opposite of exploitation. And rather than thinking that Christianity was merely birthed out of this stuff, as though there was some sort of inevitable consequence, he, he points out that Christianity was ridiculed for it, sidelined for it, was viewed as weak. In the ancient world, men had the freedom to divorce a wife without a second thought. And into that, Christianity comes and says, no, you don't treat people like that. You don't exploit people like that. But the reason that matters, Holland again points out, is the, new Christian, is the New Testament Christian framework that Christian marriages reflect the relationship between Christ and his church. And that gives what Tom Holland calls an incredible sacral potency to every man and every woman in every marriage and redefines the terms of all relationships that women are not there to be used and abused by powerful men. You know, this is why we have the outrage that we do when things like Me Too comes through, because we're not blind. We know, we know that power should not be used to exploit, but to serve. But we know it because it's a profoundly Christian ideal. And in fact, the idea of love driving relationships that people choose their marriage partner, Holland says that is the fruit of the Reformation. He says that Romeo and Juliet just couldn't, he said, have been written anywhere else. And Holland says the challenge that we're now fighting in our present culture is because of the shift that has come around since the late 1960s that says love isn't really spiritual. It's not connected to the, to the co-joining of people's bodies together. And so again, he says, we're seeing the rise of exploitation where people are encouraged to think of sex as a merely physical, not spiritual activity. We're again returning to a situation that, surprise, surprise, actually... <laughs> is better for men, in which men are encouraged to sexually harass and exploit their power. The rise of pornography and, and different things that go with it all favor men in terms of how men perceive relationships, not women. It's one of the things that he points out. And this is where we need to, well, move on. I think we need to consider what is being written here for us. What's the significance of Numbers 5 for us? Because we shouldn't read this without understanding that maybe there are some broader 
things going on than just family relationships, as though the biggest problem that Israel would face at this particular point in its history was marital unfaithfulness. I think this whole episode is broader than that. It's characteristic of God's dealings with his people. In fact, this passage in some ways is a summary, I think, of the whole of the Old Testament. It's a jealous, loving God who does nothing for his people but good, who ultimately is rejected by them as they choose to follow other gods, other idols, again and again and again. And this warning isn't really simply just to put here to say, wives, be careful. This is a warning to all the people of God to say God does not tolerate having godly, godliness or, or his holiness mixed with ungodliness. As God warns them in Deuteronomy, their idolatry will cause the promised land to spit them out. God and ungodliness don't mix. And so that's the first thing that I think is significant for us to take away from this passage. God is jealous for his people, and holiness and unholiness shouldn't be mixed. We are a people who've been sanctified. We are set apart for God's use. What are we doing mixing ourselves with all kinds of unholiness and all kinds of sins? And there's a remarkable contrast, I think, between numbers where people have to leave the camp for a time where they're unclean and our situation now. And the difference is this. It is not that God is less present with us. Okay, sometimes we think that, don't we? Oh, it would have been great being in the Old Testament. You'd have had a temple, a tabernacle with you in the middle. You want to see God? You can go to the temple and go to the tabernacle and, and have an encounter with God. Oh, how I wish that was the situation we were in. It's easy to think like that. But we miss the point. God is not simply in our midst now. He is in us now. And we were thinking actually at our community groups on Wednesday and Thursday night about being a living temple that God lives within, not just amongst his people, lives within his people. But there's something sobering from Numbers 5, something serious that comes with that. That means that we need to therefore be even more alert to not mixing holy with unholy. Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 writes this, don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? That's within you. Shall I then take members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality, he says. And he's making this point, this, this distinction for us in, 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 that follows into the New Testament. Holy and unholy cannot mix. Sometimes we have this view, don't we, that what happens in private doesn't affect the public, or they're two separate things. You know, our, our culture no longer stopped condemning a, a philandering politician because that's private life. We don't go there. The Bible doesn't take that view. Public and private are related and linked. And so the church in Laodicea, who are being accused of being lukewarm, do you remember what Jesus says to them? He says, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Why? Because holy and unholy cannot mix. You might present on the surface of being okay. You might think you know, things are right. They're not all right. If you're caught up in sexual sin or, or you, you know, there's a particular relationship that you know doesn't honor God, or you're using and engaging, addicted to pornography, or even maybe how you use sex in your marriage, We need to remember this stuff matters to God because you're trying to mix what is holy with something that isn't. And that leads to terrible consequences for the people of God. And again, we've got to remember the Corinthian church, you know, they try and bless their sins. They cover them over with the Lord's Supper. And Paul says, that's why some of you are passing away. Again, it's this idea of mixing holy with unholy. It's not a superstitious thing. He's saying holiness matters to God. And God does not permit us just to go around and and, and think of ourselves as being okay when we're not. So the first major thing for us to see, and there's only two, by the way, the first major thing for us to see, if you are caught up in some sin, talk to someone about it. Don't just write it off. Talk about it. Bring it. Confess it. Confess it to the Lord. Confess it to one another because forgiveness and mercy and renewal and rebirth is what he is all about it's not something to fear i spent part of this week reading through the report around ravi zacharias and the devastation that happens when someone uses their power and influence to exploit vulnerable people and and in in the end to silence them and i was reading the report about the accusations of of ravi all the things that he he did and covered over 
And I was thinking at the same time about a friend of mine, a church minister who confessed to the church leaders that he was the minister of and to his wife about his addiction to pornography. And I, I, his, him describing the serious consequence of that, having to talk it through openly with the church and the, how costly it was for him. So he looks back on everything that he went through 10 years ago. But also, as he realizes now, having been through and come out the other side, how God used that to show him a depth of transforming grace and mercy that he would not have experienced any other way. And his testimony is that God redeems sinners. Our culture doesn't, doesn't really have a language of redemption. It offers us very little hope. But God redeems sinners. He knows, he sees, he cares, and he redeems that's the first thing. But secondly, for all of us, God knows and sees what happens in family life. And the religion of Israel doesn't just concern the public. It, confer, it, 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 um, it concerns the private. Some of us have been profoundly wronged and hurt. And God cares and he sees and he knows about those things. He does care about those things that have happened in your history. He does care about sexual exploitation. He does see how people use power. These things are things that he cares about and he knows about. He does also care about false accusation. And we might struggle in these processes in Numbers 5 because they just feel a million miles away from us. The ancient world feels a long way from us. But we can see from them that God does not turn a blind eye to exploitation, not even in the home. He cares about truth and justice. He cares that people shouldn't be falsely accused. He cares about what people are experiencing, about how the strong use their power. He cares that people shouldn't be exploited or abused. And of course, by the time we get to the New Testament, we see Christ ministering to people, even somehow bringing together people who've experienced all kinds of oppression and hurt into the church, even with people who have a background in doing the oppression and the hurt. The offer is made to be clean, and it's bigger than an offer of a restart. It's bigger than an offer to just feel good about yourself for the first time or not be defined by the things that you've done or had done to you in the past. The offer is of having Christ make his home with you and dwelling in you. It's an offer to be clean, and that that means something significant. It means that Christ takes up his place within you and you are set apart for, as, as his. Because he doesn't dwell among us, he dwells within us. He comes, he makes his home within you. He offers you hope. He offers you transforming life. Now, I'm going to finish my sermon with words that I'm going to say every week, which is basically, can you by the end of next week, read to the end of chapter 6 and 7 in terms of um, uh, where we go uh, for next week's passage that you can read ahead because we can't recover every passage in the detail that we'd like. So I'm going to say I'm going to set you some work to do at the end of every, every week, and this week is to look at numbers 6 and 7. Well, I hope you've had some good fun with the kids making your keep out signs. You've got children at home. And you can start to have a discussion with them over Christmas, over Christmas, over lunch. What have I got on the mind? Um, you can have a discussion with them over lunch today about how it is that we can have access to God, what it means to have access to God, and not just access to God as he dwells amongst us, but what it means to have him dwell within us. Okay, so if you'd find that helpful. Shall I pray? Father God, we thank you that you are good, you are just, you are fair. Lord, we struggle with your word because it sits within a culture that so often is different from our own, and yet with people who struggle with exactly the same things we struggle with. Father, we thank you for the, the transformation that you offer us in Christ. Father, we thank you that you are concerned, that you see what happens within our relationships. Father, these things sometimes trouble us as though because you see these things, we can respond only with fear. And so, Father, help us to have the strength to confess our sins, to bring our guilt to you, and to have you minister to us in the midst of that. Father God, we thank you that we sing of uh, a saviour who redeems through the strength of his resurrection life. And we have nowhere else to go. We have no one else to sing about. 
Father, we know that we can't just sing of our own purity, but we want to sing of the purity that is ours in Christ as we are covered in his righteousness, cloaked, clothed, protected by his imputed righteousness to us today. And we want to sing of that and adore you because of that. And Father, we pray that you would help us as a church to wrestle through some of these things, to grow in holiness, to grow in integrity. Help us, Father, with this struggle, we pray that we might be your holy people. Amen.